Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so, uh, last night we all had a bit of a lecture regarding um, context, it depends, uh, being in a glass jar, uh, a whole bunch of uh, challenges really to the audience. And this project for us, and really what we're talking about when, <clears throat> you know, uh, aside from the periodic table, where's Ben's uh, talking? Uh, aside from the periodic table, we are going to be talking essentially uh, about literacy. Uh, and there's all kinds of forms of literacy. And, and in my uh, jurisdiction and in my fire department, uh, we did not have great fire literacy. So that's really what we were trying to achieve. Uh, we had a, a, a very rich history of firefighting, a very rich uh, uh, social fabric in the fire service, just as we... Uh, um, heard today, uh, that community, as you spoke to that community this morning. And that, that is what bonds us all together. So, you know, we needed to deal with this literacy issue, and that was the focus of our uh, objectives, if you will. Um, <clears throat> for those of you um, wondering, you know, uh, where I'm from, uh, from the city of Ottawa here, um, and, and right now, uh, like much of uh, areas of Europe and on the west coast of the United States, uh, we have massive forest fires in British Columbia. Uh, throughout, uh, within four hours of Ottawa, uh, there are 64 fires. Uh, am I on? No, sorry. There we go. Um, and, and, and essentially, um, uh, we're having the same problems all over. Uh, my city uh, is the result of uh, an amalgamation in 2001. Uh, we're about uh, 2,700 square kilometers is, is the response area for the Ottawa Fire Service. Um, and, and essentially we can be at a high-rise fire in the morning on, and a silo fire at night. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's the kind of range of operations that are available. And, and we um, basically have a, a, a fairly large um, constituent area. And if, if you look at all these major cities in Canada, they all fit within... Um, the, the borders of my city. And, and I believe when I did this calculation uh, many years ago, half of Frankfurt could fit in there, right? So uh, just to give you an idea of, of the response area. <clears throat> well, you know, I, I'm supposed to start with an icebreaker, so I thought I'd start with a Swedish icebreaker. Um, but essentially, you know, we, we talk about icebreaking and the fire service is just like this, right? Y y you know, you can be naked without knowledge. You can be naked without your equipment. Uh, you can get in very far, uh, and it's very hard to back out, uh, and, and you're by yourself, right? And this is, this is a big problem for the fire service, because once you enter into um, that enclosure, uh, if you don't have skills, if you don't have information, uh, you can be caught, you can be injured, you can die. And that's the difference between so many jobs, right? Um, so very much uh, uh, part of the motivation for what we do. And this man is a hero uh, in my, my books. You may not know him, but he's actually a Canadian hero. Uh, he's the winningest coach uh, in the NHL. He has more NHL uh, winning rings for the Stanley Cup than any coach in Canada. Um, and uh, Jacques Demers. Uh, at the age of 60, he, he put his hand up and said, I can't read or I can't write. Imagine at age 60 saying you cannot read or you cannot write. It's a fantastic, uh, um, you know, act of courage. Um, he used to sign million dollar contracts, multi-million dollar contracts with an X. <laughs> he would ask his friend, what do you think? You know, and yeah, he's a, that's a good player. Yeah, okay, all right. And he'd make his X. And no one knew until the age of 60. He, he has since written a book. Um, he's, a, he's a Canadian senator. And, and you know, that is a picture of him upside down, him not being able to read. And sometimes the fire service can be like that. We can't read. Um, and, and so the motivation for this project that I'm going to relate to you and some of the novel aspects of it uh, relate to our mission patch. Uh, F for firefighting, I for instruction, R for research, E for engineering, fire. All four disciplines are necessary to manage today's complex response environment, the, the activities we undertake. Uh, the Latin, sintiam in quiere in igni, is seek knowledge in fire. So um, essentially that's what we want to, our firefighters to do, is to seek that knowledge. And that became our mission patch. 
Um, as in terms of an overview, we're looking at uh, the project itself. Uh, we achieved the grant, and then that grant, uh, through the kind and generous support of many people in this audience, uh, the people that you will hear speaking and some who are not uh, speaking, <clears throat> came and supported us with their time, uh, their organizational time, uh, their, in some cases their own vacation time, and as well their spirit and goodwill. And, and uh, we we're able to turn this thing uh, into close to a $5 million project. Our objective throughout this whole process was to address the policy and capability gaps between the science of fire dynamics and the current firefighting strategies and tactics. So that was, you know, uh, the prime directive, as they used to say on Star Trek. Um, it started here, um, in as much as uh, in 2007, we had five firefighters uh, jump four stories from a building. Um, and in our jurisdiction, uh, they would be, they all survived, uh, but serious uh, physical as well as mental injuries uh, that will last, you know, scars, right? Um, and, and, and scarred me as well, because I was showed up, called in as a safety officer, uh, post uh, the jump, and uh, I was responsible for a report. Um, and that report um, identified a number of deficiencies um, and, and that 100-page report, um, uh, you know, that this, obviously this uh, presentation will be available to you. Uh, you can actually download it. Uh, it's extensive. Uh, and it tells quite a, a harrowing story of, of uh, the activities and the problems within my organization. Um, there were key recommendations, uh, uh, of 85 recommendations, and one of the key ones was the requirements for a fire dynamics course, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, if you will, an instructional design to support that, right? So that's, that's aspect of the key recommendations. And I might say out of 85 recommendations, I would say we would have maybe 75 complete uh, as of, uh, you know, the, the, the finishing of this uh, coursework. And you will note the flags in behind. That's because it, it was a very much an international effort. And as uh, stated earlier this, uh, in the introduction, it was a Canadian safety and security program. Um, and, and this program uh, basically funds uh, a community of practice. And I spoke to you, uh, some of you the other day, what a community of practice in the Canadian context. Uh, uh, the Canadian government has, has identified these gaps, much like the Swedish con uh, Contingencies Agency. Um, they bring communities together. Uh, those communities uh, meet once a year by themselves. So there's a fire community of practice, an EMS community of practice, uh, you know, police, bomb squads. There's a whole series of different communities. And then uh, on the second time of the year, all those communities meet to set priorities for research. So this is done through uh, the Canadian Safety and Security Program. Um, the project itself had, uh, you know, aside from a team from Ottawa, uh, the Calgary Fire Department, uh, Montreal, uh, and Halifax. And really, uh, to show a regional distribution. Uh, Ottawa is a combination, uh, you know, about 1,000 paid, 500 volunteers. Uh, Halifax is just the opposite, you know, like 1,000 uh, volunteers, 500 paid. And, and uh, Montreal, uh, fully bilingual, obviously. We wanted to have our um, Quebec compatriots uh, included here. And, and this is a part of the project that has not been completed, which is a translation of all this material, which is extensive. And then obviously Calgary Fire. Oh. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the players, uh, uh, we had about 75 agencies or groups uh, participating at one time or another. Uh, uh, you know, an extensive, extensive international group, uh, and we're very grateful for that as well as tremendous uh, financial support from uh, industry in terms of uh, their materials or, uh, you know, uh, uh, moral support. Um, and certainly we had uh, the two Montreal and Ottawa uh, IAFF associations were, again, uh, uh, financial and, and uh, uh, logistical support. So we ended up with a program uh, 40 hours for the student, 80 hours for the instructor, and uh, that had nine theoretical sessions, uh, practical live demonstrations, uh, live fire sessions, and there are five modules, if you will, from 201 to 205, 
Uh, and that as essentially an introduction, introduction to uh, fire dynamics, enclosure fire dynamics, fire assessment, and fire control. Um, today, I believe, uh, if those of you who have signed up for the website, and this is all free and available free to you, um, and is um, these materials, uh, I believe, might have gone up today. Um, so why? Well, we talked about that idea of fire literacy. And we wanted to focus that um, um, you know, passion and committed firefighter's mind on those things. And when we talk about firefighting, we really are talking about anticipating, preventing, intervening, and recovering. The whole spectrum of firefighting. But this foundational knowledge is key to making and enabling those other activities to happen. Right? And, and so that, again, is you know, part of that, uh, why are we doing that? So, my objective today is to, having given you that bit of an overview of why, is to just give you an overview of some of the material that's in there, uh, some of the novel uh, aspects of it, uh, make you a little bit familiar with it, uh, and uh, you know, see if it piques your interest to look further, uh, on the, as I say, on this free website. So in terms of the enclosure fire dynamics, you know, this is kind of interesting. Uh, you might, for many of you, might find this quite simple, but up until about 17 years of service, uh, this is the curve that I received. <laughs> this is the curve that, uh, that fire, this was a fire. It went up, it went across, and it went down. That's it. Uh, we were not given anything about ventilation control. That wasn't in our language. Um, and then, you know, the whole idea of decay, you know, the idea of decay and production of fuel in ventilation control, or decay because it has decayed, and there is no more fuel, these distinctions were not made, right? And obviously from that, we never had these other possibilities that could um, come across. So it may seem simple, but we went right back to basics um, because the whole system needed a reset, right? And, and in that exercise, uh, we uh, came up with a new taxonomy for understanding fire and teaching fire to our firefighters. In fact, um, this rapid fire development, uh, many of you would recognize uh, similarities or you know, uh, the content, but perhaps maybe not the order of that content. Um, and this, this um, if you will, taxonomy that we created uh, follows a logic, and that logic uh, is well supported by research papers, uh, a number of them that were evaluated. Um, essentially, what we're saying is that there's two things that can happen in a fire a flashover or smoke ignition. Now, why distinguish between the two? Well, um, one is very much quantitative. You can measure a flashover. And, and we can measure that through heat flux at the floor. We can measure temperature. We talked about this the other day. We can measure mass loss as well as uh, oxygen consumption. There's a number of ways to measure flashover, quantitative. Whereas all these other um, ignitions that occur, uh, smoke, um, and, and we don't say fire gas. This may be something, uh, you know, very common here in Sweden is fire gas or uh, gas cooling, right? We went away from that terminology. We, we say smoke cooling because um, um, we believe that this, the gas is a component of smoke. And so this uh, created some controversy in, in some places, but essentially through that smoke ignition, uh, we broke down again uh, a smoke explosion, a backdraft, and, a, and a, uh, if you will, a flash fire. And it includes a number of uh, descriptors, one being the rollover. Um, so as I say, quantitative, qualitative. And they're qualitative uh, because there's a whole set of criteria, or if you will, parameters in which these things occur. And it's the reason why we wanted to break it down this way, is to be able to better explain these events. Uh, so that firefighters could anticipate them. So this uh, was our objective. And, and, you know, trying to distinguish those smoke ignitions, again, models, we created a little model, and uh, we looked at um, the temperature of the mixture and the overpressure generated uh, as it relates to uh, the event. And flash fire has such a wide spectrum of temperature and mixture. Um, and then if you look at smoke explosion, you'll note um, it has more overpressure than a backdraft. And they are distinct events. Um, and some of you may have looked at Fleshman's work. Uh, and we distinguish between a, a flashover 
uh, on, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a smoke explosion and a backdraft, uh, by again, by uh, quali uh, qualitative aspects. Uh, what we visually see, what are the characteristics of those things. And so, uh, essentially, this is, a, a, again, a model for teaching how uh, these things are interrelated. Now, interrelationship is very, very important. Um, uh, when you look up flashover in a, in a fire text, if you want to look up the definition uh, in the glossary, let's say, or, something, or the definitions file, uh, you're going to look F for flashover. Uh, smoke explosion, uh, S for smoke explosion. Um, B for backdraft. Well, these are all interrelated phenomena. And, and uh, so they should um, actually fall under a category and then have a distribution. And so that's where that taxonomy comes in. We wanted to create these interrelationships. Um, and, and obviously, you know, that first graph I showed you, uh, and again, looking at what all these possibilities are, uh, any one of them are possible from these rapid fire developments. Uh, so essentially what we are teaching our firefighters is that this fire grows, it has a number of um, decay pathways, and then what happens is um, you can have an, any one of those rapid fire developments uh, depending on uh, how that mixture and the temperature of that mixture and how that mixture was formed, whether it was done through the gravity current mixing in a, in a, and creating turbulence in a, in a backdraft or whether the smoke moved a distance uh, and then just, uh, you know, almost pre-mixed, if you will, with air uh, and be, uh, of course, in an enclosure that would result in a, a more significant explosion or a more forceful explosion. So is it important for us to know the difference between a backdraft and a smoke explosion at 2 o'clock in the morning? No. What is important is that you understand how they can occur. And um, I don't care if you said, well, that was a backdraft or that was a smoke explosion but you need to understand those processes so that uh, when you're fighting a fire, and we saw um, some stuff from Ricardo the other day uh, involving uh, buildings that just blew up, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and people not anticipating that. Uh, so that's what we want people to do is, so we link this to the tactical reality of, uh, if you will, the anticipation of the event. So, <clears throat> uh, that kind of where we went with the fire dynamics, if you will, uh, introduction um, uh, in enclosures. And then we did fire assessment, uh, a different module, number four. And <clears throat> um, again, this is a, uh, some of you may have seen the SAFE model from Shan Rafael, uh, then the BE, which is the building and environment which is um, an amalgamation uh, to those things, uh, and then what we call the ventilation profile. And really what we were trying to get our firefighters to understand is that these things uh, have a, an integration, a requirement to look at the current state, uh, or at least uh, visualize the potential for openings, uh, movement through heating and ventilation systems, wind pressure, all those types of things that can drive or restrict fire growth and then look at them and tear them apart uh, so that, again, we would be better informed on how uh, fire uh, is impacted by the environment uh, of, the, of the box, if you will, and what to look for. Uh, ultimately, we wanted good decision making because that's where we were headed. The whole thing is about decision making. <clears throat> so we defined the ventilation profile and you'll note the entire fire buildings ventilation openings showing flow paths, air movement um, uh, in and out of the structure, as well as heat and flame. So that idea of uh, what a ventilation profile is um, takes and is well understood for many of us who have ever worked in high-res operations at fires is uh, that concept of how the building, its geometry, uh, how air is moving through the building, uh, before and after a fire is critical to our understanding of how to manage fire in high rise. Okay? It's not commonly applied to um, residential structures or smaller structures. We don't conceptualize it that way and we really wanted our people to do that. So that was another uh, you know, concept that we, we, we wanted to bring into this in terms of that ventilation profile. Now, why would we study buildings? Like this is not a building construction course. 
but what we wanted our people to do was to assess the impact of the fire and how that fire would uh, impact the structure. So that requires a refresher for us. So we, we spend a lot of time in the North American Fire Service studying buildings because we operate in them and we need to understand how fire behaves within those uh, confines, if you will. So we give a little overview and we, we classify buildings and in uh, types, uh, and, and you'll see the five types. And, and then of course, uh, you know, people refer to lightweight or whatever. They, these are all performance-based designs and, and they create a, a number of other problems. As we described, you know, the objective here is not a studying building construction, but to see how those buildings impact fire growth or decay or structural performance. <coughs> And then we blend those uh, to the building and environmental factors. Uh, we're looking at obviously the topography and how that topography can change or create uh, conditions within the structure that uh, impacts that fire. Uh, so, uh, you know, a number of effects can be a co uh, caused or uh, relate back to that building and environmental condition. Uh, so, it's well understood. Uh, we, we regularly, you know, sort of explain in very simple ways to our firefighters um, how uh, pressurization on one side, we, we use this for ventilation. It's a concept for you know, the leeward and the windward side. Um, and understanding that uh, from a ventilation perspective needs to be understood also from that, if you will, that change of differential in pressure. And this is just a picture of you know, downtown Calgary on the 4th Street Mall. Those are uh, functional sculptures because when the Chinook comes through, um, these sculptures change the flow and create vortices to stop you from being swept down the street uh, when you have a 100 kilometer wind, which is very common in Calgary. So w understanding that is part of um, how wind impacts uh, and, and how it can dominate the fire growth. Um, and then we're looking obviously at smoke, air, heat and flame. And we don't spend a lot of time, if you will, uh, you know, uh, uh, focused on one item, we, we look at an amalgam. This whole thing is about looking at the amalgam. Uh, and so, uh, but it's a way to teach the information and break it down in a sequential way so that there's, uh, you know, again, an order to uh, the development of our, of our uh, recruits uh, as well as our officers. So we understand that idea of the layering function of the gravity current. But again, I wanted to take you through the novel material uh, and, and I think it's important to understand, um, you know, that gravity current uh, can be quite disrupted by the wind uh, or, and or the combustion cycle. So this introduced other concepts uh, to what was the standard uh, descriptors, if you will, available, that being unidirectional and bidirectional flow. Um, so we redefined flow path. Uh, you may have seen in the literature, uh, a descriptor that talked about volume, talked about area. And, uh, so it is really the route uh, taken by air, heat, or flame, uh, smoke, air, heat, or flame, toward or away from an opening, typically a window, door, other leakage point. Now this, this has been adopted by NFPA in the draft NFPA 1700 standard. Now we added, Steve, maybe uh, you'll recall, we added fire <laughs> to this definition, and I, and I believe that we don't need to. Uh, because if we're going to deal with ventilation profile with before and after a fire, it's understood um, that we are talking about a fire. So I'm going to make that change or suggest that change. But essentially, uh, uh, this is what a flow path is. And, uh, and what causes that flow, and we discussed that the other day, uh, you know, uh, temperature differences, buoyancy expansion, wind impacts, and, and HVA systems. And again, Having our firefighters understand those interrelationships is, is part of uh, our teaching um, on this subject. And there are characteristics to flow uh, beyond bidirectional and unidirectional. And uh, so there's stratification uh, within the boundaries, uh, turbulence, direction, velocity, and shape all have uh, cues or provide cues to what is actually happening within that structure. And uh, that's why we use that smoke air track. So what we did is we added, um, uh, I was uh, part of uh, a, a group uh, many years ago, uh, 
uh, under the Fire Protection Research Foundation, uh, developing, if you will, uh, uh, the design for the experiments uh, and, and uh, the content that for looking at wind uh, impacted or wind driven fires. And I, I documented a number of non-standard um, presentations of flame. And, you know, that was in the smoke air track. And I thought they were quite uh, unusual. Uh, and certainly so that aspect of looking at those um, different uh, presentations made me think uh, about what, what it is we see and how it relates back to the fire. Uh, and I think that here you'll see a unidirectional flow. Um, but you see where we said a flow of smoke or air. We, we just say the smoke air amalgamates to smoke air being smoke air heat or flame, right? Because you could have a unidirectional flow of just air um, and, uh, or, you know, just heat, a heat column moving uh, through the structure. So we may play with that definition. Uh, that's a discussion for our NFPA uh, and maybe even for here um, uh, if people have some comment. Uh, the bidirectional is, uh, flows in, in opposing directions. The two-zone model uh, that we discussed the other day. Um, and then uh, dynamic flow, which is new. You'll note it doesn't say unidirectional flow path. It doesn't say bidirectional flow path. Or it doesn't say dynamic flow path. It says flow. The path is static. The flow within the path is dynamic, whether it's unidirectional, bidirectional, or dynamic, if you will. Uh, but basically, it moves, not the path. Okay? So that's why we refer to it as a flow. So it's a flow within a path. Um, so this is, you know, again, uh, an aspect of, that's quite novel and, again, has been accepted uh, for consideration in the draft. Um, uh, and, and we think this is an important <laughs> distinction. And the reason why it's so important is that we've had firefighters caught in wind-driven fires, wind-impacted fires, not understanding what, what is being presented to them. So, <clears throat> um, essentially, I broke it down into six classic forms. So these six classic forms, if you know these six classic forms, they can combine in many ways, but you will never be caught in a wind-impacted or wind-driven fire. You will not make tactical mistake of placing yourself at the wrong end of the shotgun. That's really what we're trying to avoid here. So uh, if, if the smoke, and, and really when we, the best reference for you is if you go back to the two zone model, you have the smoke flowing out across the top and you have air flowing in. If it doesn't look like that, um, there's a, a geometry of wind impacting the opening and that's what you're looking at. So we're seeing the impact of a wind coming in on an angle. So it's eccentric. So the smoke flow uh, or you know, the discharge is eccentric to the opening um, means there's impact from wind. Um, and then if you have what we call a projected element, that means it's being pushed in, in a way. Um, you know, in this case, uh, it was a PPV fan in, in Chicago uh, and some of the wind-driven experiments that, uh, well, Steve and, what, was that a NIST or, that was NIST and, uh, yeah, that was NIST at the time. Uh, so as an example of a projected. Um, now inverted, where it comes out the bottom, um, uh, you know, essentially, so you can see projected and inverted, but you could have just inverted, right? The, the flow is just out the bottom because of the way the wind is striking the opening. Okay? This just happens to be together. Um, and here's an example of inverted eccentric projected. You, you see what I'm saying? It's not flowing out the, in, in, in that typical gravity current way. It's being impacted by wind. And so, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, your firefighter's going up. We have a fire on the 13th floor, or we have a fire on the second floor. And if they have not understood that vent profile, uh, they're walking in to a very dangerous condition. All right. So hollowed is another one where basically the wind is holding it in and it's trying to lap out. Um, and then uh, pulsations and puffing. Now, uh, this one happens to be impacted by wind. Again, it was on, uh, this was Governor's Island. But uh, the wind is quite strong, holding it in, feeding the fire. The fire grows, the fire collapses, you know, back and forth. 
But you can have that same um, combustion cycle occur without the wind, right? The growth of the fire burns off its oxygen, collapses. So that was what we sometimes see in a backdraft, um, that pulsation, right? So um, it can be either or. And then uh, we refer to this as a star fire. And let's uh, bring this one up. Again, this is one that was characterized in Chicago. Uh, when I was watching it, I thought, that looks like a star. And, you know, uh, I didn't really understand it at the time, but, you know, once we put these things together, you start to see patterns. Uh, so if you look how this thing uh, behaves, this wind is being driven into the fire at 90 degrees, effectively. And, and the hollow and the star fire are closely related. And it's really uh, uh, about uh, inlets and outlets, um, how much air you're putting in and how much air can get out of the bottle, if you will out of that jar that uh, Ed showed us last night, right? If it had another hole in it. So essentially the air is coming in straight on and there's so much you know, growth of the fire and there's no, not enough exit, it pushes out but it gets flattened uh, on a structure and, and it can be quite a, a wild presentation. So we refer to that as star fire. So if you know those six patterns, you won't get into trouble is what I'm telling you. So it's quite novel in that regard. Um, and then, you know, we created graphics to illustrate possibilities. So a number of outcomes from, from this, uh, you know, development, if you will. And uh, if you will, uh, just the IFF endorsed this material, uh, I'm going to say about a month ago. Uh, last week, yeah, last week, they had their 54th annual convention. And Resolution 44 was one put in by the Ottawa Professional Firefighters, which was, um, the IFF has a number of uh, uh, projects such as a HAZMAT, uh, federally funded HAZMAT program where they, you know, uh, in small jurisdictions, they may not have the capacity to deliver hazmat, hazmat, hazardous materials support or operations. Uh, or they may not have the information. So that program is a federally funded program to uh, go into these smaller jurisdictions and deliver those programs. Uh, the same is for rapid intervention, uh, safety and survival. So there's a number. So what has happened is that uh, for the first time, uh, the IFF uh, is essentially uh, passed a resolution to develop um, uh, mobile fire training uh, to the IFF um, through their uh, granting program uh, at the federal level. So that's a big deal. That's uh, you know, uh, a huge win for us. Um, five Canadian provinces uh, have, have joined in. Uh, we expect the rest to do so. Um, it's just a matter of timing and resources and what have you. So that's, that's a big, big deal. Um, now in the draft, we, you know, that's always... Uh, as I, and I point out a draft, uh, we would love your feedback on this material. Uh, it's gonna, you, know, you can download it, you can look at it online, and, and then hopefully uh, there's a, well, there is a process for commenting, and you're more than able to uh, you know, uh, come in and, and, and give us some advice. This picture doesn't work for me, or this information is not clear. Uh, because our objective here is to have really just an open source uh, and develop it to a, to a quality level that uh, suits the fire service. Um, and in, within my own prime objective, many, many years ago, uh, you know, um, was the objective to make sure my fire department was fire literate. And, and that uh, has become a reality. So our recruits take it, and then um, uh, our recruit system is probationer, fourth class, third class, second class, first class. So a series of exams, five years, if you will, to become a firefighter, first class. And they have to do it at recruit and then in third class. And then all existing OFS personnel uh, mandated to do so. And it's integrated into the promotional system. And just a little poke, uh, the nature of things, which is the longest uh, playing science show in the world, um, uh, dedicated to uh, science. And uh, they did a documentary on a project. So you can go online and look at that. It's called Into the Fire. It's quite, quite interesting, wildfire uh, laboratory, uh, as well as uh, structural fire. So interesting stuff there. Um, I want to I wanna, uh, take you, uh, before I conclude, 
Here we go. Maybe not. Yes. To the decision-making model. And I'm going to fly around the decision-making model just because um, there's not enough time and it's just a preview. But uh, some of the things that uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Catherine Lamb, who's here in the audience somewhere, uh, effective command, uh, looking at decision-making and what makes uh, effective decision-making, um, and really looking at those decision-making aspects of situational awareness, the decision strategy, the planning, and what actions you take, and then reviewing that actions. So those aspects of decision-making um, are uh, what we call peer-reviewed, and they're uh, objectives, if you will, that can be measured. Um, so that's a really, really important aspect of what we're teaching. Um, you know, we changed the way uh, we see offensive and defensive. Uh, we, we broke down, uh, if you will, offensive into uh, rules of engagement. So, we're, you know, we're in an offensive mode, but we've uh, identified... Um, for our firefighters, if you will, uh, rules of engagement. So the military, the police, uh, UN peacekeepers, they all have rules of engagement. So are you gonna be in the offensive mode, but there's degrees of response uh, in relation to the threat that's posed. And so we chose that method, that sort of military model, if you will, uh, for uh, uh, offensive as well as defensive uh, and, and looking again at uh, what are the rules of engagement. So again, this is novel to, to, the, to our fire service and I, I suspect to many fire services. Um, uh, let me see, tactical priorities. Uh, one area that um, is again, quite controversial perhaps, let me just find it, sorry. Mm, where is it? The go, no go whether you go in the building or you don't go in the building. Um, so, you know, the actions we would take. And what we're saying about go, no go is not that you would never go, it's you need to treat the environment. And uh, so some of this, you know, we broke it again down into that smoke, air, uh, heat and flame. Now, uh, people will tell you and, and research will show you that you can't measure the smoke temperature and we get that. But if you're getting this kind of uh, temperature, we know, and again in our documents we make quite clear, is that that smoke temperature is going to be higher. And it's uh, essentially, we're looking for a number of heat conditions, pyrolysis, or well-defined contrast. So what we mean by that is the use of water. So this is a practical tool, uh, and, and they can be used individually or together. So the objective here is to teach firefighters the cues to um, um, whether or not they, when they do and, and how they make entry or how they control the environment. Really, it's about imposing a control. Uh, so assess and then control. So the go, no go. And you know, tied back to the idea of flame, no flash fire, that's rollovers, pockets of flame um, uh, within that uh, condition. Treat it, then move in. Right? So don't play with fire is basically what we're saying. Unless, I guess, you're in the teaching mode. So what that takes us to is the bricks, what we call the tactical bricks. And uh, we took everything you could do with water and everything you could do with air and broke it down into uh, a system. And again, this system got transported into the NFPA um, uh, 1700 uh, draft. And, and we think it works. Uh, so they're all laid out exactly the same. So if you could think of uh, this very simple tactic, which is exposure control, what is the objective? So we lay out the objective of the tactic for the, the learner, uh, how it works fire dynamically, right? Uh, uh, the impact of radiant heat or direct flame contact on exposed surfaces. Now, if you only wanna, if you wanna be an egghead, firefighter, fire engineer, you wanna go deeper, you can take references to our reference text, which is a science text. So, but if, you know, that's what our firefighters need to understand at a very basic level, right? Um, tactical considerations follow next. So uh, here are things to consider, right? They're, um, uh, 
then we talk about preferred technique and alternative techniques. Okay. And then any safety considerations. So the safety consideration when you're up against this kind of typically when you're into an exposure control is radiant heat or the building could fall on you. That's why we do this tactic. So that was done for exterior control, which uh, in some jurisdictions is known as transitional or was, it was dubbed transitional. And the reason it was dubbed transitional was people were transitioning from defensive to offensive and they didn't, so that's a strategy, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's a tactic. And, and so we're saying, no, this is a tactic. And so we chose to call it exterior control. Um, and, and so again, broken down in the same, very, very same way. Okay, so each of these tactics um, are exactly the same format. Um, you know, and I'm just going to blow through them. We have interior advancing, advancement. So it's an advancement technique. It's not an extinguishment technique. And, and, and essentially uh, how it works, what are the tactical considerations, uh, so on and so forth, and preferred alternative and, you know, uh, Safety considerations. So that's your uh, surface cooling, I should have said. I, I think I said smoke cooling. Uh, and then we did the same for smoke cooling, right? So the methods that are preferred, let's say, in many European jur jurisdictions um, and, and certainly are been trialed and used in, in my jurisdiction. So we have both. We have surface cooling and so uh, it, it's really agnostic is what I'm telling you. There's no religion here. Um, it's just the facts. So smoke cooling was done in the same way. Uh, interior direct attack and the same was done for uh, interior indirect attack. And then we went to ventilation and we did the same thing for ventilation. Uh, again, the tactical objective, how it works, tactical considerations. Um, and we threw in a bit of fun for those, you know, the fire SUV. Um, you know, just for fun. Um, so yeah, so uh, basically uh, we did that for all the ventilation, horizontal, the vertical, and positive pressure attack, positive pressure ventilation, we distinguish between those, and positive pressure isolation, PPI. So all, all forms of uh, positive pressure and then uh, hydraulic as well as negative pressure. So we did that for that, you know, that's essentially, um, then we move into that review following that decision-making model. So uh, essentially why the bricks were built is again for sequencing and taxonomy is that our firefighters uh, and, and we wanted to build this uh, foundational base, brick base, if you will, that we could take right up into our company officer program uh, to be able to evaluate because one of the key aspects of this was not only to teach the subject was to be able to assess, evaluate their activity in school, but also evaluate their activity on the fire ground. And so the bricks allow for that. And so how do they allow for that? So uh, I'll use Jens and I'll use Ricardo here. Jens's fire department is gung-ho on PPA, let's say, for argument's sake. And Ricardo was department with, you know, their gas uh, cooling or smoke cooling, as we say. And, and, and that's the preference. Uh, he might turn around, um, uh, come to a building and see heavy, heavy fire showing on the second floor or even the third and decide, you know, I'm gonna do exterior control because he watched Steve's experiments and, 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 you know, does that control. He forces the door, uh, applies his PPV fan, uh, moves up, could have heavy smoke, uh, uh, surface cooling along the way, and then does a direct attack on that fire. Uh, can, you know, the opposite side of that, Ricardo comes in, um, forces the door, uh, smoke cools all the way up, and then does a direct attack. He used two water bricks. He used two water bricks and one air brick. As long as he can explain to me what the tactical objective was, how it works, what the tactical considerations were, preferred technique, alternative techniques, and any safety considerations on each of the three tactics. I know he knows that tactic, and I know he understands the fire dynamics against the problem. And the same for Ricardo. They're both valid, 
they have no religion, if you know what I mean, in terms of you know, North America straight stream or Europe uh, smoke cooling, uh, those arguments that go on, we, we, we don't have any, uh, if you will, uh, belief that one is better than the other. There, it depends, as, as our good friend uh, Stefan would say. So that is the model that we provided to our firefighters, and we think it's a successful model. And in fact, uh, I shared with John the other day and, um, a, a, a letter from a Winnipeg Fire Department in which this was exactly what was done. And uh, the analysis that came back because they had been taught how to analyze, because the objective here is to, when you're looking at your decision making, is to be situationally aware, understand what the problem is, you know, look at all the factors that go into that decision making, when you take action, and then be able to review, right? Whether it's in the classroom, against a picture, against a video, in a real fire, or, um, uh, you know, in your post-incident analysis, uh, if I want to evaluate the officers, the firefighters, and then have them evaluate themselves against known, if you will, bricks. So that was our objective there. And, and because many times reviews tend to be a pat in the back, right? You were great. You did a great job, right? And uh, yeah, what did you do? Well, I brought the hose here. And, you know, there's no evaluation. And that's what was missing. And that's the only way we improve is to, you know, look at ourselves and say, hey, how did you do on that? <laughs> did that work for you? No, that, what broke? Uh, those kinds of things. And was your tactic effective? What was the fire dynamics that led you to choose that tactic? And so that's where we need to be as fire service uh, professionals. And so that's where we took the show. So um, in, in my conclusion, um, where I just get this right one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've had a lot of success with this um, uh, approach and <clears throat> we're hoping that you will have a look at this um, uh, on this website, firedynamicstraining.ca um, and I want to say thank you for bearing with me this morning. Cheers, thank you.